Welcome to you all. Young or not so young, gainfully employed or happily retired, enjoying life or finding life a bit of a struggle, Bermudian or Scottish, or not lucky enough to be either. I, I jest. Uh, whoever you are, wherever you're from, it's wonderful that you are actually here this morning, gathered in this place to bring your worship to God. If you are a visitor, you're especially welcome, and I would invite you to sign our visitor's book that you'll find at the back of the north aisle, the aisle that faces me, and also to stay on with us after the service for refreshments. Come into the courts of the Lord. Come and sing for joy to the living God. Come and listen to these words of the psalmist. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. These words come from Psalm 84, the metrical version of which we now sing in our opening hymn, Hymn 52, How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts, to me. Before we bring ourselves before God in prayer, let us recall these words from the first letter of John. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, for God is love. As we resume our seats, let us approach this wonderful God of love with our prayers of adoration and confession. Let us pray. Loving God, Creator and Ruler of all, all good, all loving, all merciful, we come into Your house to worship You. We come to acknowledge Your greatness, to celebrate Your love, to thank You for Your mercy, and to rejoice in Your unchanging purpose. We also come to focus our minds upon You, not so that we should turn aside from Your world or forget its needs but so that we might return to our daily lives 
with a greater vision for your purpose, a deeper sense of your presence around us, and a firmer resolve to serve you in the place where you have put us. Awaken us afresh, we pray, to the wonder of your presence, the mystery of your person, and the extent of your will. Inspire in us a new sense of your majesty and authority, so that we may worship you, not just here in your house with our lips, but in the world beyond these walls, with our hearts and minds and souls. And so we ask you to meet with us now and help us to live each day in the light of your presence. Give to us a constant awareness of your greatness and your love, so that whatever confronts us, whatever challenges we face, whatever situation we find ourselves in, we may be equipped to meet them in your name and to offer lives of true discipleship that are pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we ask it. And now, in words he taught his disciples, we join together to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God, whose almighty word, chaos and darkness heard, let us sing the hymn number 112. Hear the word of God, first as it is found in the Old Testament, in 1 Kings, chapter 8, reading verses 22 to 30, and then 41 to 43. This can be found in the Old Testament section of the Pew Bibles on page 312. 1 Kings, chapter 8, reading from verse 22. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, 
O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. The covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him, you promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, There shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your children look to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day towards this house, the place of which you said, My name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer of your servant, Praise towards this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. O oh, hear in heaven your dwelling place. Heed and forgive. And continuing from verse 41. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm. When a foreigner comes and prays toward this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and so that they may know your name has been invoked in this house, that I have built. Our readings continue in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, reading chapter 6 from verse 10 through verse 20. And this can be found in the New Testament section of the Pew Bibles on page 195. Ephesians chapter 6 reading from verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. 
Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. Again this week, I want to begin with some brief comments on our Old Testament reading. Last Sunday, we heard about King Solomon succeeding his father David and praying to God for wisdom. Today, we meet up with Solomon again, but a number of years later. By this time, he's built the temple for the Lord God of Israel, but once again, we find him praying to God, and it's quite some prayer. Praising God, yes, but also asking God to listen, asking God to fulfill His promises, and asking God to listen to the prayers of those we might today call seekers or inquirers, people who are at the start of their journey of faith, people who are out with the regular community of faith or membership of the church. Why is He doing this? So that they might find God on that journey and come to realize that they are themselves part of God's story, this incredible story that we all find ourselves in. If that was good enough for Solomon 3,000 years ago, it's certainly good enough for us today. So, in our prayers this week, let's remember those who are at the start of their journey of faith and ask that God sustain and encourage them on that journey. But now let's move on to consider our reading from the epistles, once again from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. As you'll see from the order of service, I thought I should entitle this reflection, What Are You Wearing Today? Now, ladies, before you all rush to tell me or show me, uh, what I really want to know is, has anyone got their clothes on outside in? Or let me put that another way. Are you wearing something that has the labels on the outside? You know the kind of thing, free advertising with the name or symbol on the outside, the Nike tick, the Ralph Lauren polo horse or whatever it might be, the name of whatever fashion house emblazoned across the front or perhaps on a slightly more subtle label somewhere else but never on the inside where labels really ought to be. Is anyone in the congregation going to own up? No, we obviously don't have enough young people here this morning. Sometimes the clothes we see people wearing can actually tell us something about the person wearing them. Most obviously, some people's clothes do give away what their occupations are. Policemen, firemen, nurses, even ministers. Maybe, though, the church is missing out on a marketing opportunity here. Maybe we should all be wearing clothes with Christ Church Warwick emblazoned across the front. Or maybe not. After all, whatever people wear, it doesn't really tell us very much at all about what's on the inside of the person. Perhaps, therefore, we wouldn't expect the Bible to be much interested in what we wear. But that's not so. Listen, for example, to the first letter of Peter, where he says that all of you must clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another. Or as Paul writes in his letter to the Colossians, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Above all, Clothe yourselves with love. And in today's reading, Paul also speaks about how followers of Jesus should clothe themselves with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes that will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. I challenge you to go into Hamilton and find any of these in Gibbons, Coopers, or anywhere else for that matter. Quite obviously, we can't buy the kind of clothes that the Bible is talking about in shops. They come from God. They are His gift to us. And of course, they're not really clothes at all in the sense that we put them off and on. 
Rather, they are qualities that should clothe our lives always, today in church and every day out there in the world. Hopefully then, people might see from how we go about our lives that we are followers of Jesus Christ, and so we may spread the good news of Jesus' love, wearing whatever clothes we like. Perhaps not surprisingly for our next hymn, I have chosen hymn 515, Soldiers of Christ Arise and Put Your Armor On. Listen again for God's word for us this Sunday morning as we turn to the pages of the Gospels and there to the Gospel according to St. John, reading in chapter 6, verses 56 to 69. You'll find this reading on page 98 of the New Testament section of the Pew Bibles. John chapter 6, reading from verse 56. Jesus said, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you, there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Amen.
Thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word. To his name be the praise and the glory. Again, if you have looked at your order of service, you'll see that I've entitled uh, the gospel reflection, Jesus asks the twelve, do you also wish to go away? You may recall that uh, having, you may recall having heard these words in the reading itself, and I'll certainly be highlighting them for us all again shortly. This will be the fourth and final week of my reflecting on John's account of Jesus' discourse about his being the bread of life. It's a fairly lengthy part of, of the gospel. And in today's part of that account, John tells us that not only did the crowd struggle with what Jesus said, so also did many of his disciples. Indeed, it was they who said to him, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? And then John tells us that many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with Jesus, as I hinted would happen last week. But it wasn't just what Jesus had said about his being the bread of life that was the problem. For the final straw appears to have been when he spoke in our passage today of being the one sent by the Father and who would return to the Father. By the end of chapter 6, it's only the twelve who remain to be addressed by Jesus. And the question he puts to them could hardly be more direct. Do you also wish to go away? In other words, to turn their back on him, reject him. And their answer, as ever, is given by Peter, who replies, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. The disciples, at least, have heard and understood. For Peter goes on, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. It would, however, be going too far to suggest that they've grasped the full picture and certainly when the crisis does come, as it does later in the gospel story, they'll still perform badly. But there is something that even now sets them apart from others. Those who have gone away, who have turned their back on Jesus and left him. Within this one chapter of John's gospel, we've moved from a crowd of 5,000 men following Jesus at the beginning of the chapter to just 12 men at the end. And one of them is going to betray Jesus. Hardly indicative of mass conversions. And maybe, maybe that should be a comfort to the church today as we struggle with falling numbers coming into our community of faith. A comfort, yes. An excuse for doing nothing, certainly not. After all, didn't Jesus continue with his ministry, just with this small number of disciples? But as for this crowd that has drifted away, it might also be said that they can hardly be expected to fully comprehend all that Jesus had said. After all, the disciples, the twelve, had been with Jesus for about three years by this time, and even they needed to await the coming of the Holy Spirit to really grasp what it was all about. And likewise today, our need is for both spirit and flesh if we are to grasp the life that is offered to us in Jesus, life that Jesus himself describes as life in all its fullness. Life that begins now and continues eternally. Jesus' words may sometimes be hard to understand and maybe even harder still to apply in our lives today. But what Peter said remains as true today as it was the best part of 2,000 years ago. You have the words of eternal life. In every congregation, People are at different places on their journey of faith. Some may be just setting out. Some are striding confidently on. Some may be struggling, 
less sure of where this journey is taking them. But we all share the one overarching story, God's story. And we need to be there for each other, to listen to each other's stories, and to support each other on our individual journeys. My prayer for you all this morning is that you may come to the same conclusion as Peter, that Jesus does indeed have the words of eternal life, and that you too might come to believe and know that Jesus is the Holy One who has come from God. To God alone be the glory. Amen. Our next hymn choice It was also an easy one for me, uh, although I suspect a hymn that is not known to you. Um, If you look at the words in your order of service, you'll see that they include the lines, you have the words of eternal life, you are Jesus Christ the Lord. Let's make that proclamation as we sing the hymn that is printed there, you are the King of Glory. You only sing you are the King of Glory once at the beginning, the first line is the heading So you sing, you are the King of glory, you are the Prince of peace. Uh, Oliver, do you want to play the tune through first so everybody can hear it? Please be seated. Let us now respond to God's love in our lives as we make our offering.
Let us pray. Gracious God, receive not only these gifts, but also the givers, unworthy though we are, and poor though our response can at times be. Accept what we are, but shape what we shall be, and so use us to further your kingdom here on earth, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Church news for this morning. Uh, firstly, to say that the, the church office has resumed normal service. Liz has returned from holiday, so uh, the office will be open as, as usual. Um, I don't think there's a great deal uh, additional to say. We continue to worship at 10 o'clock next Sunday. Uh, one thing I would let you know is that I heard just this morning that Reed Kemp has died. Uh, some of you will be aware he has been unwell for some considerable time. Uh, and our thoughts go to the Kemp family at this time, not least to Jimmy. Uh, and I ask you to hold them in your prayers this coming week. Let us continue our worship, singing hymn 526. Even in the face of death, this is a day of new beginnings. We sing it to the tune, Spiritus Vitae. be seated. Let us once again bring ourselves to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, we come to give you thanks for all you have given, to celebrate your greatness, your power that created the universe and that sustains our lives and the life of your creation, to celebrate your goodness, your love, revealed in Christ, that reaches out in forgiveness, filling our hearts and minds, to celebrate your faithfulness, your covenant with all creation, and your new covenant in Jesus Christ, made real for us in bread and wine. And so we thank you for life in all its fullness, faith in all its richness, 
and our fellowship with Christ in all its wonder. You have blessed us beyond our deserving, and so we ask that you will help us to show our gratitude by living as your people and using your gifts wisely and responsibly to the glory of your name. Lord, as we think of your gifts to us, we pray for your creation, the world in which we live. And as we think of areas spoiled and laid waste by human greed, and the ways in which humanity has overturned nature's delicate balance, we pray that we may, even yet, be taught to care for your creation. We think, too, of people made needy by the greed of others, of human relationships poisoned by war and hatred, and of those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. Lord of all human life, even as we meet for worship, the world goes on and people live their lives in sadness. Little children are robbed of their innocence. Mothers clutch fitful babies to long dry breasts. People walk in fear on city streets and gunfire rakes the tattered remains of once loved homes. Lord of all human life, even as we meet for worship, the world goes on, and people live their lives in joy. Children laugh and play and learn. Families are held in loving security. Communities are built on justice, love, and care, and bridges are built across some war-torn lands. Lord, as we meet for worship, Give us a renewed solidarity with all your people. But especially we pray for the worldwide church of which we are part, especially those in it who feel themselves doubtful, discouraged, or confused. May they and all of us be cleansed, united, encouraged, and empowered by your Spirit to go out into the world to spread the word of life in all its fullness. Help us and all Christians everywhere to play our part in accompanying those setting out on their journey of faith, so that through your Holy Spirit, they may be sustained and guided on that journey. And Lord, we pray at this time for the Kemp family. May they know your presence with them, your love for them, your arms around them. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our concluding praise is the hymn 498, Angel Voices Ever Singing Round Your Throne of Light, hymn 498. <laughs>
Go on your way, knowing that God goes before you. Share your faith with the uncertain. Share your love with the unlovely. Share your presence with the lonely. And share God with everyone, just as God has shared Himself with you in the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore.